you. Um, so we all signed up for a course um, over the next five days that will be talking about plastic pollution in the environment. And um, I think you know it's it obviously would be a little bit of an exaggeration, but that's never stopped me before, um, to suggest that you know in, in a year or two or a few years' time, when you go to a restaurant and order the seafood platter, that you might be served up with something like this. Mm -hmm. um, clearly we're not quite there yet. But I think everybody around the world is, is well aware um, of, the, of the fact that plastic pollution in the environment is one of the most pressing environmental problems that we, that we face um, today. And in this course, over the next few days, you're going to have um, presentations and you're going to hear from a number of experts at UCT's Fitzpatrick Institute for African Ornithology. And they're going to talk about the origins, the spread, and the impact that waste plastic has in the environment, with a particular focus on the waterways of Southern Africa. So the science faculty at UCT particularly prides itself on the range and the scope of the research that's carried out by our really often brilliant staff and students. And I think we're going to get a bit of a taste of that this week. Um, we, have a, we house a number of experts on many of the critical issues that face our planet. And as I say, over the, over the course of this week, you're going to hear from some of those people. I'm just going to very briefly introduce the two speakers who, who um, are up on the program today. So the first person is Professor Peter Ryan, who's sitting over on the side over there. Peter is the director of the Fitzpatrick Institute for Or um, African Ornithology. He's a very highly cited researcher. He holds an NRF rating of, of A, which is a, a recognition that he is seen by his, by his peers as an international leader in the, in the research that he's carrying out. And Peter has published over 300 papers in the, in the um, scientific literature, but I was particularly interested to note on his on his CV that over 40 of those particularly relate to the topic of this course in the issue of plastic pollution. Um, he serves currently on the International Scientific Committee for Oceanic Research, and, and that is a, a body that, that is advising governments uh, around the world on how to monitor and, and deal with environmental cases. And the other presenter that you, you'll meet today is, is Monica Perrault, sitting down in the front row here. Monica holds a master's degree in zoology from the University of Pretoria. Um, she's been working um, in, in the, the area of marine plastic pollution projects since 2015, and quite recently um, has, has um, spent time sampling plastic pollution at, at sea on various research expeditions, which include the, the Indian and the South Atlantic Oceans. And I hope that perhaps you'll tell you a little bit about some of those. And we're very delighted that from 2019, Dr. Monica is actually registering as a PhD student um, with uh, the, the Fitz Institute and, and uh, will be continuing her research um, at GCT. So I wish you all the very best for a, an exciting and, and informative um, course and hope that, that, that you will enjoy the, the, the presentations as they proceed. As I'll hand over at this point when you can arrive at the Thanks very much, Susan. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm not saying much today. Um, we decided to split it up one day, one day, one day. So I'm going to hand over quite soon to Monica. But if I can work out which light is which, we'll just... Uh, is the uh, yeah. Okay. And press the button. So, Susan's already introduced everyone, but we just put in some slides just so you know who's going to be talking to you. So on the left there, in the pink jacket, is Monica aboard the SA Gullis 2, doing some field work. Monica, for the last two and a bit years, has been working closely at the Hans Hoheisen uh, Charitable Trust, who've been funding her primarily to work on the impacts of solar uh, power generation on, on biodiversity, and in particular birds. Um, but on the side, we've managed to slip in quite a few little bits and pieces on plastic. And then on the right, uh, Eleanor Weidemann, who's going to be talking on Wednesday, but unfortunately I won't be here, which is shame, I'm afraid. So Eleanor, you're going to have to be gentle with because I'm not going to be here to hold her hand. And I'll leave Monica to introduce her. But Eleanor's um, spent the last year looking at plastics in freshwater systems in South Africa. 
uh, and so I think she has some, some really interesting messages to share and some preliminary data. And then the final lecture on Thursday um, is someone not from UCT, but someone who we work with closely, Anya Ogden, uh, formerly from WWF South Africa. Uh, and Anya's formed the Beach Car, which is uh, an NGO involved very actively in tackling uh, the marine debris issue and plastics in the environment. And she'll be telling you a little bit about what her organization is doing, but in a broader context of what are the sorts of solutions that we can uh, apply to this pressing environmental problem. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Bonica. Bonica's giving the introductory sort of overview lecture, so she'll put plastics in a, a broad context, tell you why we should be concerned, and then tomorrow I'll maybe dig in and ask us to be perhaps a little more critical of some of the things that you see banded around in the popular media. Okay, so that's it for me. Over to you, Bonica. I've got your speaker on. Um, can everyone hear me? Do yes. I need a microphone? Everyone good? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Monica has a tendency to sort of start to fade. So if, if you don't hear her, just wave. We're very informal. It's a small group. So if anything's unclear, just show. Okay. Thank you, <coughs> Okay. So for my talk today, I'm going to take you way, way back to the late 1800s. So this was during the height of the ivory trade. And ivory was a very sought after product because it was used in commonly used household items like cutlery handles, um, door handles, buttons, and especially billiard balls that were really sought after. Now the demand for ivory put a lot of pressure on the infant populations and conservationists were very concerned. So a call was put out to engineers and, in, and entrepreneurs to come up with an alternative to replace ivory. And in 1907, this fellow, Leo Bakelin, came up with the first real plastic, it was, and it was called Bakelite. Some of you might even recognize some of these items in these pictures. So during World War I and World War II, Bakelite was used in various applications, ranging from medical equipment to army helmets to weapons. And slowly but surely, plastic started developing and were used in various applications in the household. But where it really entered the lives of ordinary people is with Tupperware in 1948. And I just want to refer you to this um, image from a Life magazine taken in 1955, which actually celebrated the throwaway living culture that we're fighting against today. So as time continued, um, the technology changed and we ended up with these main types of polymers. And each polymer has a specific polymer code, ranging from one to six, identifying the polymer type. Now these codes are usually printed on the plastic items and are very important when you are recycling your products, which I think Arnie will delve into more in her lecture. So, plastic really is a fantastic material. It is versatile, inexpensive, it is lightweight, and it has a very long lifespan. And that's exactly the properties what makes it so fantastic to use in packaging. So globally, of all the plastic produced, 30% is used solely for packaging. And this packaging is designed to be of single use and used to dispose of shortly after it was used. In South Africa, the statistics are even worse, as we have 53% of our packaging is designed for single use. So if we look at the trends from 1950 up to 2050, 15, sorry, we can see that more than 300 million tons of plastic waste has been generated. And it's just an increase. So the same properties that makes plastic so fantastic is also why it's so dangerous once it ends up in the environment. Because it's versatile and inexpensive, it is used for one-use applications and discarded because it doesn't really have any value. Because it's lightweight, it can disperse easily into the environment, either by waterways or through wind and various other avenues. And it also has a long lifespan, which means it persists in the environment for up to hundreds and hundreds of years. So what happens to a product once you've finished with it? Well, it can either be recycled, incinerated, landfilled, landfilled sorry, dumped or littered in the environment. 
And statistics have shown, have shown that from all the plastic that's ever been produced, only 9% has been recycled, 12% has been incinerated, and 79% has either been landfill, dumped, or littered in the environment. So once plastic enters the environment, it often breaks up into smaller, smaller pieces. And therefore, we have to classify it by, by its size. <coughs> so I've made this sort of comparison for you to illustrate the different size categories of plastics, starting with mega plastics, which are really large, larger than a meter um, items, going down to macro plastics, which could be something like a, a water bottle, and then going smaller to meso plastics, which are often just smaller pieces of plastics that have broken down from the larger pieces, all the way down to microplastics, which are in the size range of bed bugs and dust mites, and nanoplastics, which are in the size range of bacteria and viruses. Now I want to talk a bit more about microplastics. You get two types of microplastics. It could either be primary microplastics, as seen here, which were purposefully designed to be that small. An example would be cosmetic microbeads that you find in facial scrubs or toothpaste. And um, the other example would be virgin pellets or noodles, which some of you might have heard about recently with the big noodle spill in Durban Harbour. So just for those of you who are unfamiliar with noodles, these are, the these are basically the starter kit for most of the products that you know. These pellets were shipped all over the world to factories where they are melted and shaped into most of the products we use today, our water bottles, our containers, Etc. So, in Durban, in the Durban Harbour, it was in 2017. Yes, there was a cargo ship with containers filled with these virgin pellets, and during a massive storm, two of these containers tipped over, and 49 tons of these plastic pellets entered the environment, and they just leaked out of the harbour before there were any measures were taken. And just to zoom into that photo I was showing you, this is what it looked like: just billions and billions of these pellets floating in the ocean. And then you also get secondary microplastics, which are with larger pieces of plastic break down into smaller and smaller pieces, um, either through mechanical, UV, or microbial processes. Alternatively, it can be synthetic microfibers that are shed from our clothing, because the majority of the clothing we wear is made out of plastic or synthetic uh, textiles. <laughs> um, and it's been a, um, calculated that washing just one synthetic polar free stock, you can release up to 1,900 fibers into the wastewater system. So all of this mismanaged waste eventually reaches the marine environment, or potentially reaches the marine environment. But what's the big deal? You know, why should we care? Well, because plastic pollution has various harmful impacts which I will discuss in some detail now. The first and most visual impact is entanglement. And the majority of entanglement <coughs> is due to discarded fishing gear, which um, coined the term ghost fishing, whereby items such as ropes or nets are discarded and continue killing animals way after um, their intended use. But it's not only limited to fishing gear, there are other high-risk applications, such as six-pack rings, up there, but fortunately that's been banned in South Africa. And then things like balloon strings, because people believe or well, let balloons go. And other items like packing strips or lead rings are also quite high risk applications. And then the second major visual impact of plastic pollution are the little on our beaches. And this is severe economic impacts. And it's been calculated that working for the coast of South Africa, spends more than 100 million rand per year cleaning our beaches. It also acts as a barrier to gas exchange and smothers the seabed. And the impact of this is that it um, produces anoxic conditions, it reduces primary production, it reduces the amount of organic matter, and then ultimately reduces invertebrate diversity and abundance, affecting the, in, the marine ecosystem. Now, plastic can also act as transport vectors, aiding in the spread of invasive species. And a classical example of this is the spread of a barnacle from the coast of Australia all the way to the UK, and creating havoc in the environment there. Another impact is disease. And, and plastic waste has been associated with diseases in coral reefs because it causes light deprivation, it creates anoxic 
conditions and it results in toxin release. Toxin release. And plastic litter is also considered to be a vector for the spread of pathogens. And last year, I was fortunate enough to be part of a pilot study looking at um, plastic litter as a vector for the spread of cholera in Zanzibar. And in these photos, you can see this is raw sewage coming out of a small house in Stone Town. And that directly leads into the rivers, which ultimately ends up at this big dam at the waste dump, which is an informal area where people just dump their waste. And we tested plastic from all over these areas for cholera, and lo and behold, they tested positive. So plastic litter is acting as a vector for the spread of cholera within these small communities. And it is an important emerging issue, and we hope to continue this research this year. And then finally, one of the biggest impacts of plastic pollution is ingestion. Studies, this recent study that was published by Duncan et al. found that 100% of all turtles tested, of all seven species, contain microplastics. And these turtles were sampled in the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the Pacific. And globally, globally sorry, 78% of all seabird species checked contain ingested plastics. However, all species are not affected the same way, whereas species like the great shearwater contain a much higher proportion of plastic compared to other species. In a study done by an honest student at UCT, looking at these common species found around South Africa and um, this coast, she tested these um, species for microplastics, and she found, in all of them, she found microplastics ranging from 80% to 44% in the red eye. So what are the impacts of plastic ingestion? Well, firstly, it can block the digestive tract of the animal. It can also influence the buoyancy, either because of the direct density of the items ingested, for example, plastic bags, which have a low density, causing the animal to float. This is particularly um, significant in turtles. And also, it has the um, possibility of causing gas blockage, which also um, results in the, the turtle floating to the surface, unable to dive down and forage. It can also cause injury to the digestive tract when sharp items are ingested, which punctures the tract or ruptures it. It reduces the stomach, stomach volume of the animal, and it also creates a sense of false satiation, where the animal believes that it is full and it doesn't need to eat anymore. And it is also known to um, adult toxic compounds, which could impact the health of the animal, but I'll get into that a bit later. So if plastic is so bad for you, why would you eat it? The first reason is called secondary ingestion is when animals eat contaminated prey. And this is often found in fur seals, where, you can, where they ingest fish that are contaminated with microplastics. And you can often find the plastics in their scats. And that's a classical example of the trophic transfer of microplastics in the environment, whereby the small, um, smaller, small, small creatures ingest the smaller pieces, and it moves up the food chain as those smaller animals are, are ingested by larger um, animals and it eventually reaches apex predators. It could either, also either be primary ingestion where it's accidental because the animal conf either confuses um, the, the plastic for food or it's accidentally ingestion, ingested by the mean of filtration, for example, muscles or filter feeders, and they could accidentally ingest the microplastics. Or it could be that um, food attaches to the plastic, in the case of Asian albatrosses, they, um, flying fish eggs is a very sought after dietary item for them. And flying fish lay their eggs on plastic debris, which then entices the albatrosses to eat the plastic, leading to accidental ingestion. And then I just want to go back to the deliberate ingestion. It often happens, once again, in turtles where they, they mistake things like plastic bags for jellyfish. However, in the study um, that we were involved in, looking at loggerhead turtle hatchlings that washed up along the coast of South Africa, we looked at the color of the plastic grain gesture. And it seems like for hard fragments and bags that they preferred clear or white particles or uh, pieces of plastic. But when we compared it to the amount of, or the proportion of um, plastics available to these uh, turtles in the environment, 
you could see them. They were selecting for white and blue particles, but they were avoiding clear particles, which means that deliberate ingestion did occur, but it was not for items that looked like jellyfish, meaning the clear items. And then furthermore, biofilms that grow on the surface of plastic products, like, for example, this knickknacks packet, could promote ingestion by organisms like anemones. And this photo is actually taken just um, at surface corner in Musenberg, where we often found anemones ingesting plastic. So let's go a bit closer to home. The food we eat every day is very likely to be contaminated with microplastics. Researchers have found it in honey, seafood, um, even mussels, and a range of other food items. It's even been found in our household salt. Um, it's been found, there's actually been a few studies published on this, and uh, we had a student working on a salt product project last year comparing two common household brands of salt in mm -hmm. South Africa, and we found microplastics in every single salt that we analyzed. Bad news, it's also found in beer. Um, this study was done in Germany, and of all the beers tested, they found microplastics. And then also quite shocking, it is found in tap and bottled water. So just because you buy bottled water does not necessarily mean that it's microplastic free. Furthermore, it is found in the air we breathe. Remember that, that I spoke about the synthetic microfibers earlier on, that are released from our clothing? Well, that is all around us in the air, and we are breathing it in constantly. And a recent study looked at the health implications of um, airborne microplastics. And they found that it could cause airway diseases, interstitial lung disease, and perhaps cancer. So ultimately, the point I'm trying to make is we are what we eat. And when we eat animals that are eating the microplastics, the plastic can bioaccumulate up the food chain um, into our diets. But what's the big deal? Well, plastics have these nasty additives like um, uh, flame retardants and plasticizers, which um, we end up ingesting. But also, there are legacy pollutants um, that are uh, prevalent in the marine environment, and they have the ability to absorb onto the plastics in which we, that we ultimately end up consuming. So it really is, there are a lot of health risks associated with this. So, just to tie it up, I want you to all look at this and see this is the cumulative plastic waste generation and disposal since 1950. We are here at around 6,000 6, million metric tons. And it's estimated that by the year 2050, it will exceed, it will reach, you know, exceed 25,000 million metric tons. And my main question is, where will all that plastic end up? Is this the legacy what we're leaving behind? But my colleagues, um, Peter, Eleanor, and Anna will elaborate on this topic a bit more. And um, thank you for your time. Yeah, any questions? So. Thanks, Bob. Can you turn the lights up? You would rather rattle through that. <laughs> so we have quite a lot of time. I was thinking we were going to not have time for too many questions today, and we would save most of the discussion for Thursday when we were talking about solutions. But we've got so much time, I think. Uh, if anybody wants to, maybe we can turn up the, the main hall lights as well so we can all see each other. If anybody wants to ask Monica some questions or the rest of the panel can chip in. Can we go back to some of the diagrams? I think we want time to... Sure, we should. Yeah. Um, this is the statistics in South Africa mm -hmm. about um, controversy. So one of the things we can perhaps usefully give to people who are really interested in this, there's, there's an awful lot of really good literature, there's also a lot of really bad literature and stuff. So one of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow is sort of selective reporting and being at least intelligent about how you interpret things. But there are, there are a couple of really nice reports that have come out in the last couple of years that we can, you know, they open access, freely available. This is from a UN report that came out in 2018 on single-use packaging. Um, which is just an easy download from the web. 
so we can maybe uh, find some way of sharing the, the links for those kind of things. With, I'm not sure how we communicate with all of you, but we can. Is there a class list? I mean, the, the interesting thing I think about this statistics is the fact that South Africa is, is you know, sort of above the above the line in terms of packaging. We're really not doing very well in terms of managing our single use of plastic. Is there any other slide you particularly want to look at? Well, maybe somebody else can ask questions. And we can... You had mentioned um, that you microplastics in connection with. Uh, And there, 
there's, there's quite a lot of speculation, but there's very little hard evidence as to what they do. We know they can transport into the body of organisms, but we can't readily measure how much there is in organisms in the wild because we can't detect them unless we label them in some way. So the only way we can tell something is plastic, if it's that small, is if we deliberately label it with a radionuclide or, or some, some way to actually detect it. So if we just let plastics degrade naturally in the environment, once they get that small, we have no way of knowing where they are because they just come up as an organic compound. Because plastics are just organics, they're just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they just put together in such a way that bacteria haven't evolved a way to deal with them. But maybe that's changing. Um, so there's, there's lots of lots of things going on. Are there, are there differences in the environmental impact between plastics that are dense in the sink and the plastics that are less dense in the floats. Um, is, is the one group from the environment easier than the other, or is it just about the same story? Um, so it depends what kind of impact you're talking about. Sorry, Ron, I'm talking over here. Um, I think from an entanglement perspective, generally lightweight plastics tend to be a, more of an entanglement issue, um, although uh, things on the seabed can become entangled, so corals and stuff, uh, so more dense plastics can be problematic on the seabed. Um, so it, it's not just the density, it's the size, the shape, um, you know, uh, it, whether a piece of plastic is likely to be eaten is very much dependent on its size. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if something's big, it's not going to be eaten by something unless it's a really big thing. So, mm -hmm. so size is, a, is an important dimension. <laughs> Density does play a role. It's particularly important for dispersal. So whether something is a dense plastic that sinks uh, means that it's much less likely to travel big distances around the planet. Um, so we tend to focus on the more lightweight plastics simply because they're dispersed for, from source areas. But it's something I'll, I'll explore a bit further. So I'm not sure whether I've, I've fully answered your question. I think it's like all these things, it depends. Um, Thank you. Yeah, not easy. So the gentleman Yeah, just a couple of clarifications maybe. There was a side that I put a trophy on it and I had no idea what it was. Um, and there was another side I thought was about six abbreviations. It sinks in seawater, it's got a density of about 20% more than seawater. 
so if you take the bottle lid off, it will go to the seabed and not disperse terribly far. Um, high density polyethylene, despite the name, is still less dense than seawater. It's about uh, a couple of percentage points less than seawater in density. PVC is a dense plastic that sinks. Low density polyethylene, obviously, is, is pretty lightweight. Polypropylene is, is about the lightest of the plastic polymers. And then polystyrene, um, we tend to think of polystyrene as expanded polystyrene, the, the clamshell that's illustrated there. Obviously, that is very lightweight and floats very well and disperses large distances. But you also get unexpanded polystyrene, straight polystyrene, things like um, disposable cutlery. If you go to the cafe here, they'll give you a knife and fork made of white plastic, that's polystyrene. Mm -hmm. And that's quite dense plastic, it also sinks. Um, so, do the numbers mean the thickness of the plastic? No, the number is just a recycling code so that. So the bigger the number, the harder it is to recycle. No, it's just a randomly assigned number no. that says so. You know that if if you if you you know if you want to know what is this plastic, you know it's a one. That means it's PET. Okay. Um, so I guess, which ones can't be recycled? Well, seven is the worst because that's yeah. other, which is exactly. typically. What is <laughs> so the, the worst thing you can do with plastics is to just to land it, you know, put them into a sandwich. So you have three different types of plastic, or you put a foil layer in between, or card and plastic. Then it gets really difficult to do anything with it. Um, so other seven is like the worst. But all of the others are, in principle, recyclable. Um, but it, it, the, the whole thing with recycling becomes an economy of scale, um, and yeah. somewhere around, and you can talk about recycling until the cows come home. It's it's. It's more feasible if you've got the volume exactly. and you don't have to transport it. Mm -hmm. But why are things still being, why is seven still being produced if it's such a problem? Uh, so in some cases it's because of specific properties, so things like chip packets. You need the foil layer uh, to keep your chips fresh. If you don't have fresh chips, you're not going to catch them. So there are certain applications where it's... And there's just it's, no wide-scale solution to that yet. Uh, oh, I, I, I haven't come across one. But, uh, well, there's uh, John Keyser from Plastics SA says there's a, a recycling um, company in Durban that recycles chip packets. So the problem with recycling is really that there's no national program and it varies from city to city and from <laughs> and that is a huge problem. And I think it's really up to us as consumers to start pushing back and to say we don't want Following number seven, that's yeah. a big no-no, and, and that's been a drive change. Yeah, I mean, if consumers go to Woolworths and refuse to buy stuff because it's never packaged or exactly. it's, it's got a seven on, then they'll start yeah. to take that. The other way one can do it, obviously, is top down. So the Department of Environment Affairs, who's mandated in this country to deal with this problem, they talk the talk, but it doesn't translate at the moment. Um, mm. But we'll see, um, maybe after the election. <laughs> and then you touched on the government, because I was wondering if I could come to the whole course, but are we going to touch on legislation? And I just wondered if you had any more insight as to where we're at with the fight. Can we cover the issues? Of well, the DEA called a meeting while I was away last year and didn't invite any of our teams, so we know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that they are working on Rumaya. Um, she had to do some research um, to look at what. Um, the South African government would potentially ban when it comes to single use plastic. Um, but she was just doing the research for that. I don't know what happened in the meeting and I don't know what the final decision is that gets made. Because obviously the research is just the form of the research and the decision gets made. Yeah. Um, you remember that meeting we had? Sorry, we're getting a bit incestuous here, but we had a meeting about the middle of last year with people from DEA uh, and they talked about. Um, Earbuds and straws in particular? No, I didn't make it. Okay. So, so they, they gave a fairly clear signal that they were going to <coughs> phase out plastic earbuds by the end of last year. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's happened, but no, you know, they're, they're certainly, as I say, talking the talk. Woolworths was also supposed to phase out plastic earbud sticks. Mm. And that we can make them. There's not going to be And they still selling them. And I only said it was going to happen very soon, like, uh, last year. So, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't seen any um, paper earbuds sticks, so. And lollipops 
mistakes are always found by teachers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, ladies. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see
it's, it's, again, it's a lot more complicated answer, I'm afraid. So, so these are broad categories of plastics. They are not, they're not the be-all and end-all. They are not just six types of plastic and the other. So within PET, you get different grades. And within HDPE, you get different grades. And the challenge for the recycling people is if they want to use that plastic in an expensive injection molding type machine again, they have to be very sure that they've got all the same grade because it's got to melt at the same temperature. If you try to put some recycled plastic into your very expensive extruding machine and it doesn't all melt and it blocks the jets, then, then your machine is, is basically bugging. So, so there's, there's some technical issues around recycling plastics. The other end of the spectrum, you have the mixed plastic recycling, the plastic bench option, where you just take all grades of plastic and chuck them into a great big, it's not quite fancy little bits that are going to get clogged up, a great big machine that churns out big planks, and that's, that's the other option. But the, I think the bottleneck for the recyclers is not the ease of recycling, it's the, the ability to get guaranteed supply of material. If you could tell someone that they can get a ton of any polymer a week, they will set up a, a viable operation and make money and employ people. The challenge is to make sure that they get a steady supply of material. And that's where the municipalities should be coming in. Because if you go to Cape, you know, Cape Town, we're building mountains on the Cape Flats of rubbish. The coastal park, I mean, I live in Musenberg, and you can't see the Hong Kong Hong anymore. You see this sort of mountain of rubbish that's being built on the on, uh, mm -hmm. coastal park, and the same at Fissiswok. So the, the city council should be providing at least space and free storage to the recyclers to actually reclaim. And, and they, they're kind of moving slowly in that direction. Coastal Park is getting a, what do they call it, a transfer facility mm -hmm. next year. You know, so it's, it's happening, but very slowly. So everything, all plastics can be recycled. Um, it's, it's really a supply issue that's the, that's the issue. Sorry, there was a question there. Um, if I can go back to the uh, plastic uh, in the UK, they have to use a charge for the in the Great success. Part of the but then in the supermarkets are giving out bags for life, which are more substantial, which people are supposed to take back several times. And when you're in the amount of the number three, they've now just worked out that they're actually using more plastic in bags because people weren't be using the bags for life. And they're actually using more plastic in bags than when they have the food in bags. It's not simple. Hand over to Hayley. No, I don't have too much to say about that. It's just the unintended consequences. When we think we're doing something good for the environment, we're not looking at that big picture. And that's a prime example. I don't know that, actually. It's interesting. Because you always hear the good news. Oh, they have a down. But that's interesting. Consumers, we should be voting with our purchasing power, people who don't overpackage, don't overprint. So one of the big challenges to recycling is, is the amount of dye that gets put into the plastic. The more that they make it look really fancy to appear on the shelf, the more difficult it is to recycle. So we should be encouraging, you know, sort of simple, uh, you know, everything that the marketers don't want uh, is what we should be doing. Um, Should they not 
be able to see the end of their life cycle themselves in their that feeling of the human process. Yeah, I mean, credit to Grave is one of the sort of founding principles of how we should tackle the problem. So we should be telling to manufacturers, you know, you're producing this stuff, you must have a plan. Yeah. Um, but it's it's easy to say that, but it's difficult to actually get No, there's no there's no legal requirement no. this stuff. They, they are working on the EPR, which is the end producer responsibility. So extend the extend responsibility. And that is um, I don't even know how that's I mean, one, one option is to go the same way that we've gone with fisheries and, and forestry products and so on, is to say, you know, we'll have a certification process and, and you're, you can put on a certification notice onto your product that says this product meets whatever standard. So that's one approach. Um, the other approach that WWF is talking about is trying to come up with a sassy equivalent. So instead of having a red, green, uh, orange labeling for fish products, we'll have red, green, orange for packaging. So you can buy this product knowing that there's a plan in place to do something with it. It's got your green labels with it. Rather than this recycling code, which is, you know, I mean, the fact that you as an audience were a bit confused by the recycling code to me is quite shocking because I thought we'd be talking to the converted. <laughs> but that's that's great. I mean it's great that you we could inform the customers. In Sweden they have a system that works quite well. Every single food output that I'm aware of has a machine near the entrance and you put your PET book bottles in, you can also put your um, tins, your plasticized tins in. All it needs is this barcode, plus it says on the side you get one chrono, which is the smallest five of the mountains you need for each one of those that you deposit which means you get very little lying around the streets because the ones that are not that are thrown away are picked up by the kids or by the people who are terribly poor and they make money that way. Um, and I mean that's not that difficult to do. They of course add one pronoun onto the cost of the item. Otherwise you couldn't get it back. But you know, that is one way of going if you're serious about recycling. I think we're going to have to probably cut it short now because we were supposed to be out of here by four and we're going to pick up on a lot of these themes in the final lecture and I think we'll, we'll have a more wide-ranging discussion then. I think the, the level of engagement indicates how passionate people get about this subject, which is great. Um, so we, we